This is Africa News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Africa News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for Pan-African news and world developments. I'm Yehi Swuhib in Washington. Coming up on Africa News Tonight... Because of the war of independence in the 1950s and 60s, which was one of the most brutal and impactful wars of independence, you know, in the whole sort of liberation of That's colonies. That's William Lawrence, professor of international relations, speaking about Algeria's relationship with France. Details coming up also. There are calls for the AU to revamp its panel of the wise. Janet Yellen is wrapping up her trip to Africa. And Pope Francis has criticized laws that criminalize homosexuality as unjust. We'll have these stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. Algeria's powerful army chief general, Saeed Changarai, is on a discreet but extraordinary official visit to Paris, the first by a top-ranked Algerian general since independent from France more than six decades ago. General Changarai met Monday with President Emmanuel Macron ahead of a meeting with French Defense Minister Sébastien Lecognou. The general's visit comes five months after Macron visited Algeria. William Lawrence, professor of international relations at the American University in Washington, discussed the visit with VOA senior analyst Mohamed El Shanawi. First of all, there are very thick relations between Algeria and France, despite all the problems historically. There's a huge economic relationship, there's a defense relationship and security, number of security issues. A huge Algerian diaspora lived in France, a large number of French people who deal with the Algerian government, but a very poor relationship at the very top. Over the last 60 years, because of the war of independence in the 1950s and 60s, which was one of the most brutal and impactful wars of independence, you know, in the whole sort of liberation of colonies around the world and the Cold War struggles. I mean, it really puts Algeria at the top of the non-aligned nation movement, uh, it gives them a huge role at the UN, you know, and in the global south. And, and yet there's this animosity between Algeria and France that prevented this type of meeting from happening for, for over half a century. So for this to begin happening is evidence of the thaw that's going on in Algerian French relations. And so this is the next step. Many people would call Saeed Shingriha the, the power behind the throne. You know, he's the one that took over when Bouteflika stepped down from power after huge protests in Algeria that forced the, the longtime president and out of power. And he, you know, it's almost in certain respects more important that he goes to France than the Algerian president goes to France, because in many ways, the Algerian president is the front facing representative of the real power of Algeria, which rests very much in the military and intelligence services that, that are the ones that sort of choose the president from behind the scenes when the, the government puts up one candidate for president uh, in elections. So this is very significant. They have much to discuss. There are many, many aspects uh, of the relationship uh, that can be improved by this type of top level interaction. And the, you know, the more meetings they have like this, the better can improve so many things, whether energy supplies from Algeria and Africa going to Europe, dealing with the Ukraine crisis, huge security issues that ring around Algeria, you know, sort of conflicts in every direction that can be dealt with, can start solving certain problems that haven't been solved for decades. Algeria and France have mutual military concerns, notably in the unstable Sahel region that borders southern Algeria and where French troops are fighting Islamist extremists. The French also likely have deep concerns about the increasingly bitter relationship between Algeria and neighboring Morocco over the Western Sahara. What are France's objectives behind inviting the Algerian army chief on that respect? Certainly better coordination on both of those files. So as you said, if you look west, you have the Western Sahara conflict, which has been frozen since the 1990s with no progress moving forward and a, a new French-Algerian consensus over the issue since 
since France sort of sides with Morocco generally, would be fantastic. There's a number of terrorist threats to the southwest and the south. There's the Mali conflict, which engendered a huge French intervention, which is winding down now. And there's an increasing Russian presence down there, which is causing the atrocities, the Wagner group. There's the instability to the southeast towards Niger and Chad and coups and threats. And then, of course, the, the Libya conflict, which is in a truce right now, but there's also a severe political crisis going on. And then the uh, instability in Tunisia with, with the presidential coup and the huge economic crisis and the $700 million Algeria has had to shell out to Tunisia just so they can pay government salaries and feed the population. So just instability right around Algeria and so much that the French and the Algerians could do together to, to deal with all of these crises. Mali is perhaps the biggest one that could move forward with better coordination, better coordination between these two sides and getting beyond the sort of rigid ideologies that prevent them from helping or acknowledging the other from intervening in these conflicts would be a huge step forward. That was William Lawrence, Professor of International Relations at the American University in Washington. He spoke with the VOA's Mohammed El Shanawi. Reuters news service says France is recalling its ambassador to Burkina Faso one day after Paris said it would withdraw its troops from the country. The French Foreign Ministry says Ambassador Locke Hallade would take part in consultations on the state and perspectives of our bilateral cooperation. France said yesterday it would withdraw its troops next month after Burkina's military leader, Ibrahim Traore, asked him to leave. About 400 French special forces have been helping fight an Islamic insurgency there since 2018. Some have criticized the effectiveness of the troops, and the Traore, who took power in a coup in September, has relied on Russian mercenaries to fight the extremists. The Associated Press notes that withdrawal comes five months after France pulled its troops from Mali. France has 3,000 soldiers in the Sahel, mostly in Chad and Niger. Africa has entered 2023 much as it began 2022, burdened by regional conflict, extremist insurgencies, and economic stagnation. Analysts say the African Union achieved few notable successes in 2022 as far as keeping the peace goes, where the brokering of a ceasefire in Ethiopia's Tigray region being high on the short list. Some African experts are calling on the AU to revamp its panel of the wise, comprising five respected African leaders who each serve three-year terms to reinvigorate peace processes. Darren Taylor reports. The panel of the wise was established in 2007 as a key AU initiative to end wars, conflicts and gender-based violence and to prevent genocide. Members are chosen from the North, East, South, West and Central regions of Africa. Current incumbents include former Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and former Namibian President Hifekepunye Pohamba. Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation at the University of Johannesburg, Professor Saif Kedan says it's time to reassess the panel's role. I have been critical on this subject for a long time. You know, having this elites, you know, our former president, vice presidents, prominent figures in the panel of wise is very critical and it's important. Undoubtedly, you know, they have done a number of significant interventions in the continent, but it has never been, you know, widespread or doesn't have, you know, a structure of sub-regional, regional and national level. Professor Ulf Engel of the Institute of African Studies at the University of Leipzig says the panels definitely enhanced the AU's mediation capacities. Kidan says the AU must build on these achievements by reforming the panel of the wise. You know, we had been pushing the African Union just to have you know, a broader approach and to have also not only the elitist approach, only just presidents, rather than to go to academia, civil society, youth, women's and other structures. 
He points out that elderly ex-politicians don't have a monopoly on wisdom. To help solve and prevent conflict in Africa, Kidan says intelligent people from cross-sections of African societies must be invited to the panel. They'll be needed, he says, because several factors mean the panel's going to have work for many years to come. The way in which we conduct our politics, that is the most important one. Also, you know, tribalism, identity politics, geopolitics, foreign intervention, poverty by itself. Don't forget that Africa is a very vast continent uh, with 55 countries. And there are so many actors who are playing in different parts of uh, Africa. Kidan says the African peer review mechanism also needs revival and strengthening. The AU established the APRM in the early 2000s as a way for member countries to monitor one another's governance, policies and standards with the aim of fostering peace and political stability. Kidan says it's had mixed results. This APRM it could be effective because of individual countries who will uh, never be willing to be evaluated. And one thing is also lacking, it, it doesn't have, you know, carrot and stick mechanism. Whoever does wrong, it doesn't have any uh, punitive action. So APRM, it remains now as a research institute rather than correcting, you know, the governance problem. Kidan says both the APRM and the Panel of the Wise are hamstrung by lack of financing and resources. He points out that the panel doesn't even have a budget, so it has to plead with the AU every time it wants to become involved somewhere. As a result, says Kidan, the panel's currently suffering an identity crisis and not able to establish itself as a true organ for peace in Africa. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Today is the third and last day of U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's South Africa visit. She started out in Senegal, then Zambia, before she arrived in South Africa. Journalist Tuso Kumalo has been monitoring the U.S. official from Johannesburg, and he spoke with me about the visit a few hours ago. Welcome, thank you. So what is the Secretary's agenda today? What was it? It was quite a packed day for of Secretary Ellen today because she had a string of meetings. She kicked off her day early morning as early as 8 when she met a South African finance minister, uh, Ino Kodongwana, where there the two discussed issues, amongst other things, uh, climate change financing, issues like sovereign debt resolution for Africa, uh, anti-money laundering strategies, and as well as looking at South Africa's economic outlook, which is it does not look uh, very good currently. After that meeting, she went into a lunch with the uh, uh, U.S. ambassador to South Africa, Ruben Brigett, where the business people also joined in that lunch and discussions around there were the ease of doing business uh, in both countries, as well as the opportunities uh, that uh, businesses in the U.S. Uh, can have here in South Africa in, in, in partnership with companies that are here in South Africa. After that, then, she had to head to Ford Motor Company. Uh, this American company here employs about 4,000 people, and this one of those companies that uh, uh, is being put as an example of what uh, investment can do uh, to South Africa in terms of alleviation, alleviating poverty and uh, unemployment and all other uh, things in terms of building uh, the economy. Uh, then the last one for, for the day was uh, the meeting that she had with the Reserve Bank Governor, Lesitja uh, Hanyaho, where, of course, they discussed issues issues uh, around financial intelligence and, of course, how the two banks uh, can also uh, be used to, to empower citizens and, of course, facilitate businesses between the two countries. The country has been embroiled in an electricity crisis which scheduling rolling blackouts hitting businesses and households for up to 10 hours. Uh, that topic never came up? That issue has been discussed. What happened yesterday at the end of the day is that she went into a door meeting with uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa, which the media had no privy to what was discussed. But today, in one of the briefings, 
uh, Ambassador uh, Ruben uh, Brigade managed to talk to the media, and she say, he said uh, uh, in that meeting with Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, the, the Secretary Ellen discussed at length uh, this energy crisis that's happening in South Africa and what uh, can be done. It was also on the plate with the uh, uh, finance minister, uh, Inoko Dongwana. Yesterday, she also met uh, uh, the energy minister, uh, Mantashe, where they discussed that issue. So that issue is being discussed across the board because it is currently affecting South Africa's economy. And, of course, America bringing in, uh, we know that there were funds that uh, were presented to South Africa so that uh, the country can move into renewable energy. And, of course, that was the topic as to how uh, that can 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 be a solution to the current crisis that the country is failing, where people are going for hours uh, without electricity. Yes. Uh, also, you said renewable energy. Africa's most developed economy, South Africa, relies on coal to generate about 80% of its electricity. So is there plans to reduce that? Currently, the government is moving towards that. There was a stumbling block. Uh, the legislation, the policies around the introduction of renewable energy were the stumbling blocks for independent um, energy producers. But so far, the government has removed those and allowed companies to produce their own, uh, own renewable energies. It has allowed also uh, individual uh, producers uh, that want to, to, to rely on solar, to rely on wind, to come forward and, and do that. So it is expected that... Uh, Within a short time, experts are saying between now and up to two to three years, we could start seeing some of the results of that, people coming into the grid. But currently, uh, the problem in South Africa is that energy is needed, is needed now, not two years down the line. So that's why the country now still relies on coal and still also we see it's trying to maintain the coal stations because currently there are no renewable energy stations that can sustain the grid as much as uh, the economy needs. To Sokumalo from Johannesburg, thank you for your input. Thank you. Pope Francis has criticized laws that criminalize homosexuality as unjust and said God loves all his children just as they are. In an interview Tuesday with the Associated Press, Francis also said that homosexuality is a human condition. Somos todos hijos de Dios. Speaking in Spanish, the Pope says, God loves us as we are and for the strength that each one of us has to fight for our dignity. He goes to say it's not a crime, although he said it's a sin. But he says, let's make the distinction first between sin and crime. And he notes that the Church considers it a sin to lack charity with one another, but that is not a crime. The comments come days before the Pope leaves for a visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan. Many countries in Africa consider same-sex relationships to be criminal acts that can lead to prison. He acknowledged that Catholic bishops in some parts of the world still support laws that criminalize homosexuality or discriminate against the LGBTQ community. He attributed such attitudes to cultural backgrounds and said bishops in particular need to undergo a process of change to recognize the dignity of everyone. And he said the church can help change such laws. Francis says, yes, yes, it must to do this. He says the bishops are part of the cultures in nations, but they have a process of change. He said bishops in countries where homosexuality is illegal are open to helping not only with this, but also with other problems. And he stresses there is a need for tenderness as God has with each one of us. The Pope flies to Kinshasa next Tuesday and then goes to Juba on Friday. VOA Africa will be covering his trip on our radio and television programs on and on voaafrica.com. So as you just heard, Pope Francis heads to Africa soon. Millions of Catholics in the Democratic Republic of Congo are eagerly awaiting his arrival next Tuesday. Preparations are underway in the DRC, which has the largest Roman Catholic community in Africa. It is the first visit from a pope since 1985. 
Sylvester Kimbassier is a project manager of partnership and peace building for Catholic Relief Services in the DRC. He describes to VOA's Carol Van Dam what the Pope's visit means to ordinary DRC citizens who have been living through decades of conflict and poverty. For Congolese people, the meaning of the trip of our Pope is first benediction, benediction from God. Second, it is a reconfort. For them, Pope is here to reconfort people. Also, he is here to call for reconciliation and peace. And finally, he is here to pray with Congolese people. Can you go into the first aspect of that answer, benediction? What do you mean by that? Yeah, benediction, because here in DRC, many people think that we are living in a malediction (laughs) because of the abundance of our natural resources. And the Pope come to bring benediction from God by his visit. It is not always that the Pope comes here, but this is an opportunity to to meet people and to provide blessing from God. A lot of people would say to that, you know, blessings are nice, benediction is nice, but that's not going to change things on the ground. What do you say to that? It will not change things materially, but it will change things in the point of view in area of spirituality and behavior. People think that Pope is a big leader, a religious leader, and he can influence their their behavior. So it will br- it will be bring sorry a hope in DRC. Who is the Pope expected to meet with when he's there in the DRC next week on the first leg of his trip to Africa? Is he going to meet with ordinary Congolese citizens besides political leaders? And might he even meet with some of these, you know, feuding groups in in the DRC? He will meet uh, diplomatic corps. He will meet people who are working as caritas. He will meet young people too. Of, Of course, he will meet the president and the government of DRC. Well, what are the expectations of the Congolese people from this trip? Do they believe that Pope Francis will be able to make a real difference in convincing, you know, some of these militia groups to lay down their weapons? Well, I think that the people hope that Pope will provide orientations, orientation that will put them in the path or in in the way of reconciliation and peace. What kinds of humanitarian activities is Catholic Relief Services involved with in the DRC, and what kinds of things are you going to be involved with looking down the road? Catholic Relief Services right now is providing assistance to people displaced from war and violence in Katanga province, yeah, as well in Kasai, the big Kasai provinces. He does so in North Kivu, too. That's uh, Sylvester Kimbese, the Catholic Relief Services Project Manager for Partnership and Peacebuilding in the Democratic Republic of Congo. He was speaking to my colleague Carol Van Dam from Kinshasa in the DRC. And with that, uh, we wrap up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yehiyas Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest development on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Barro, and our engineer, Patrick Dea, thanks for choosing the Voice of America.